non-raffle winner, Bill Anderson, will introduce today's speaker. I do hope to one day win the raffle again <laughs> and rub it in Chad's face. Um, today I'm pleased to introduce Greg Dobbs to the club. Greg has an incredibly varied career in journalism of all types. Um, in television, predominantly at ABC News. Um, he's done work at 2020, Nightline, Good Morning America, World News. Um, he's traveled all over the world to do that work and all over the country. Additionally, he spent uh, almost four decades here in Colorado, and during that time, uh, he was at Rocky Mountain PBS, he wrote for the Denver Post, he wrote for the Rocky Mountain News, uh, was a host of a show on WKOA, so he's got uh, roots here in Colorado. In addition to uh, uh, work in television and radio, he's also uh, involved in, in internet media as well these days through Substack. Um, He's covered stories that vary tremendously. The list of topics that Greg could cover with us today is probably much longer than the list of topics that he couldn't cover. Um, he's, he's covered Agent Orange in Vietnam. He's covered the US funding of the drug war in Colombia. Um, he has covered apartheid in South Africa. Um, relevant to the Nelson Mandela comment. And I emailed Greg yesterday and I said, hey, I just want to make sure you know where you're going. I'm sure you're proficient with the navigation apps. He said, I have found dissidents in Soviet Moscow and rebel fighters on the Sahara Desert. I will find you. <laughs> and I am incredibly grateful that he did. Greg Dobbs. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for that interview. I can hardly wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, what I'm going to say is what I think I know about terrorism. That's what I was asked to talk about, just to make the rest of your day pleasant. But terrorism is something we, we desperately need to understand, and although there, there are only seldom major acts of terrorism against this country by foreign terrorist groups, it's still something that everybody ought to understand and maybe you need to understand a little bit about what the United States is trying to do about it. So I'm going to begin by talking about terrorism uh, then and now. The then refers to the roughly 20 years that I spent mostly overseas, largely in places that were hostile to the interests of the United States. Uh, I've been beaten, I've been shot at, I've had machine guns held to my temple. I've even, <laughs> this is a story even the legendary Walter Cronkite could not have told, I've been chased by a gang with machetes. I've had three different friends, journalist friends, in three different countries killed right next to me. So it might sound a little callous if I say old timers like me refer to that as the good old days. Because in all those years, there were plenty of terrorist groups and terrorist acts, and I covered some of them. But by and large, there were still traditional wars. Not that that's a great thing, but I mention it uh, separate and apart from terrorism. In a traditional war, one army tries to defeat the other army. And the ones I've covered, whether they've been in the bush, whether they've been in cities, whether they've been in the desert, and I've covered eight wars since the 1970s, they were traditional wars where one side eventually gets to the capital and tries to, to, tries to conquer the organs of government. They try to conquer the leadership palaces and offices. They try to conquer the telecommunication centers, uh, the broadcast headquarters, the military depots. One try, side tries to conquer the other. Terrorism is different, as we learned when we went into Afghanistan and uh, confronted Al-Qaeda. 
there's no central state, there's no uniformed army. That's why the war on terror, which is known by the name counterterrorism, that's why that's different too. It's no longer just a matter of the United States going onto a battlefield and trying to defeat an enemy army. Now, a large part of the war on terrorism is to strengthen our defenses, not only here at home, but at our facilities, our, our, our military bases, our embassies overseas. It is to try to strengthen our intel, our intelligence on terrorist groups. And ironically, the internet, maybe it's not ironic, but the internet has made that easier because they use the internet to communicate with their followers. And if they can send messages on the internet, we can see them too. So in a way, that's made it easier. The largest part of American counterterrorism activities has come since 9-11. That really put a spark under us, even though terrorism has been a part of the world's life for a lot longer. <clears throat> and now Russia's war in Ukraine, not just by the way, changes some of that again. Because Russia has been committing terrorist acts in Ukraine for, what, three and a half months now. Russia's been committing terrorist acts. It doesn't do it like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and others like that, which are in hiding and then they come out of hiding and strike and then they go back into hiding. Russia, as everybody knows, has been doing it out in the open for all the world to see. And yet it has been terrorism nonetheless because Russia has been committing terrorism by the definition of the United States of America. I, uh, you might be interested to know there are something like one and a half dozen U.S. government agencies that deal at some level with issues and events of terrorism. And yet they don't have, the United States government does not have a single unified definition for the word terrorism. They all have their own wording, but they all mean essentially the same thing. And here's what it is. Terrorism means an act of violence against non-combatants, translation civilians, to achieve a political or social end. So by that definition, Russia is a terrorist state because Russia has been very clearly to everybody indiscriminately, and there are too many accounts to dismiss that it sometimes deliberately attacks non-combatants for political gain. Hopefully, and I say presumably, we won't be dealing with that kind of terrorism forever. But the other kind of terrorism, the other kinds of terrorism uh, with which we've all been living at least secondhand uh, for, for most of our lives, uh, that we'll probably live with for a long time more. Uh, I myself in my career, I've, I covered the PLO and Yasser Arafat. I covered uh, Hamas, the terrorist group in the West, in the, uh, not the West Bank, the other Palestinian territory, the, uh, the Gaza Strip in Israel. I've covered Hezbollah. I actually just serendipitously with a camera crew came across the creation of Hezbollah. That's in Lebanon, just north of Israel. Uh, about a year after the Iranian revolution, it was being created by Iranians who were training Lebanese dissidents, which became Hezbollah, another terror group. Uh, I've covered the Taliban. I've covered uh, FARC in Colombia. I've covered Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Al-Shabaab is the terror group. That means the youth. And they've been terrorizing northeastern Africa. Uh, covered, uh, for those of you who remember back this far, the Red Brigades in Italy and the IRA in Northern Ireland. They're all terrorist groups, but here's the thing. Uh, the ISIS terrorist does not look like the terrorist from Al-Shabaab. And the terrorist from Al-Shabaab does not look like the terrorist in the Philippines, who doesn't look like the terrorist in Nigeria. Boko Haram is what they call themselves. Boko Haram means, in their local tongue, uh, no Western education, and that is the target of their terrorist acts. And that doesn't look like the terrorist in Nicaragua, who doesn't look like the terrorist in the, in the Caucasus of Russia, who doesn't look like the terrorist in... San Bernardino or Orlando or New York City. The point is, uh, these are not your father's terrorists. They have different faces, <clears throat> excuse me, they have different names, they have different 
slogans, they have different causes. The very fact that I can mention ISIS and the IRA almost in the same breath hammers that home. And yet there is one thing they all have in common, and that is a strategy, and the strategy is anarchy. The strategy is to, to rip apart the status quo for the purpose of social or political gain, for the purpose of their social and political aims. What's more, not everybody defines terrorists the way we do. And maybe the best illustration of that is anecdotal in my experience, and it involves the longtime dictator from Libya, Muammar Gaddafi. I was, uh, you know, in the network news business, everybody has the territory of expertise, and mine was the Middle East. And so I had been in Libya a number of times. I had interviewed Gaddafi a number of times. So when, and I, this was sometime during the Reagan years, uh, there were terrorist attacks coordinated simultaneously at two airports in what was then known as Western Europe. And in both cases, terrorists shot up and killed a couple of dozen people waiting in lines to check in for flights with U.S. flag carriers. I don't remember anymore to be sure, but it was probably P uh, uh, what, Pan Am and TWA. And uh, I was with a camera crew somewhere in southern Europe, not far from the coast, as a matter of fact, the Mediterranean coast, when I got paged. Raise your hand if you remember what a pager is. <laughs> I got paged, got to a phone, called headquarters in New York, and they said, there have been these terrorist acts. We want you and the crew to charter a plane and get to Libya as fast as you can. So we did. That's part of what you do in the business. Shortly after we landed and the authorities let us land, they evidently decided, you know, having Western journalists come in, not such a hot idea after all, because Reagan had pointed a finger immediately at Colonel Gaddafi for harboring the terrorists who mowed these people down in the two airports in Europe. So they didn't, they actually turned a few other charter flights around with Western journalists, told them you can't land here, go home. We ended up being the only ones allowed in Libya. When we landed, we went straight, which is what you do, we went straight to the information ministry and requested an interview with the leader. That was Colonel Gaddafi's title. He was a colonel from his days in the army, but he was the leader. He called it an egalitarian country, so they didn't, he wasn't a president, he wasn't a prime minister, he wasn't a, a, a potentate. He was the leader. He was the first among equals, but he was the leader. Uh, and I requested an interview, and their response was what it always had been, the three or four other times I'd gone down there, not so urgently, but still, it was go to your hotel, stay in your hotel, we will call you. I didn't know if that would be one day or 10, but it was a big news story at the time, so we went to our hotel, waited patiently, and on, I think it was the second, it could have been the third night, I got a call literally at 3.30 in the morning, and it was the information minister himself who said, you and your camera crew be outside in 15 minutes. It's the middle of the night. He said, we're gonna give you a tour of the antiquities. Now, the Romans roamed that area and others, uh, many, many uh, millennia before. Uh, and I had already seen all those antiquities. I had no interest, but they are a cryptic people, the Libyans, at least the Libyans who led the country in those days. So I thought we'd better do it. And I called the camera crew, apologized for awakening them from their sleep and said, we got to be outside in 15 minutes. Bring your camera gear. So there we were and a yellow school bus. It could have been bought from the used bus barn here in Boulder. A yellow school bus pulls up. There were three Libyan journalists on it and three local print journalists, and then the three of us got on. And we start driving. Now it's, you know, it's four or so in the morning. We start winding our way out of Tripoli. I fell asleep. Why wouldn't you? I'm awakened by the cameraman after the bus is pulled up to a stop. He shakes me by my shoulders and says, look. And we were next to a muddy field. It, it doesn't rain much in North Africa, but it had rained the night before. It does rain, and it was a muddy field, and he pointed, and maybe a quarter mile off, a tractor was going away from us, and it was flanked by people running alongside on either side, and the cameraman, his name is Patrick, he said to me, it's Gaddafi. So I kind of rubbed the dust out of my sleepy eyes, 
And we piled out on the bus, and I'm carrying the heavy camera tripod, and he's carrying the camera. In those days, it cost about $150,000. This is in 1980s money. It wasn't, it wasn't a cell phone. Uh, the sound technicians carrying all the other gear, including heavy batteries and all. We go running across this muddy field to catch up with the tractor. And when we do, it's going very, very slowly. It stops. Who do you think is driving the tractor? Colonel Gaddafi. And he acts surprised that we're there. It was obviously a setup, but he acts surprised. And so we stopped, and the camera crew knows, let's, let's get ready to do an interview if he allows it, which is obviously what he was going to do. And I start shouting. He hasn't turned off the tractor. So I start shouting, make, call it not small talk, but small shout, with Gaddafi just passing the time until the camera crew can catch its breath and set up the equipment. And I said to him, what are you doing? He says, I am tilling the fields for the people. Now he, he actually spoke pretty good English. It was heavily accented, but he had a decent vocabulary. He says, I am tilling the fields for the people. And I shouted, do you do this a lot? And he said, I mean, he knew me because I had interviewed him before. He said, yes, I often tilled the fields for the people. At about that point, the cameraman gave me a little wink, which meant we've caught our breath. Uh, we, the gear is ready to go. Let's do the interview. So I shouted at Gaddafi. I said, we'd like to ask you some questions. Would you turn off the tractor? He starts fishing around for the key and cannot find it. This man who tills the fields for the people cannot find the key. And one of his bodyguards, that, those are the people who are running alongside with heavy weapons strapped over their shoulders. One of the bodyguards tries to save him from embarrassment, reaches under a little metal ledge and turns it off. And Gaddafi says, I always forget. I always forget where that is. So anyway, I, it's off. And I said, may I ask you a few questions about the attacks at the airports uh, a couple of days ago, a few days ago in Europe? He says, of course. And when you're interviewing somebody like him, particularly in a nation where they could make you disappear and nobody would ever know, you want to be very careful in a number of ways, one of which simply is how much time you're going to get. He might give me 10 seconds. He might give me 10 minutes. So you want to get right to the point. And within a question or two, I said, were you responsible for harboring in your camps in the southern part of this country the terrorists who shot up the airports in Europe. He paused just briefly and said, we do not support terrorists. And then he stopped. There's something else you have to learn when you do my kind of work. How long do you let the pause last? You could let the silence linger until he is uncomfortable enough with it that he starts talking again and maybe implicates himself. But you can also let it linger long enough that he says, OK, that's it. Thanks for coming. Bye bye, boys. So I don't know how long the pause was after he uttered that one sentence, we do not support terrorists. It was probably four or five seconds. But it felt like four or five minutes. And I was about to open my big fat mouth to keep him from dismissing us when he did first, after having told me, we do not support terrorists, he said, but we do support freedom fighters. And the moral to the story, obviously, is one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. And that's part, not all, but part of what can make it difficult for the United States to, 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 to fight terrorism, because we, we define it in different ways. But something that makes it even harder is the state of the world, because there are more uh, unstable states than there used to be. And unstable states mean uh, a breeding ground for terrorists, and a breeding ground for uh, terrorist groups to recruit new terrorists. What they do is look for people who are oppressed or displaced by their governments, by uh, their dictators, by poverty, by hunger, by war. They become those people's families. They become their community. They give them a roof over their head. They give them uh, food on the table. And they give them, by the way, no small thing, they give them power. 
people whose lives meant nothing suddenly have power. I, I, I said at the beginning of the talk that I had machine guns held to my temple twice. Once was in Beirut during the Civil War, once was in uh, Tehran during the Revolution. And in both cases, those guns were in the hands of teenagers. Teenagers who had my life in their trigger finger. That was power. That had to be the best day of their lives. And I'll never forget it because it made me realize that anybody can become a terrorist. They don't have to be ideological fanatics. They can be guns for hire. They can be people who are hungry. They can be people who, who need a job. But the bottom line is that general instability is a breeding ground for terrorists. And that makes things very difficult for the United States to fight because we can't make the world such a better place that that instability disappears. So instability and something else. The sometimes uh, insurmountable gulf between cultures is another obstacle to a successful war on terrorism. And here's, here, here's an example. Again, another, my whole life is just anecdotal, but it's an anecdote this time from the revolution in Iran. I spent almost the whole revolution, beginning with martial law, which was, I think, in 1978, into the revolution. And then, of course, all of us went back for the hostage crisis after the revolution. But during the revolution, there were fundamentally two reasons why the vast majority of people, not only in my estimation, but in the estimation of virtually every international reporter who covered the revolution, the vast majority of Iranians wanted to be rid of the Shah. And there were two reasons. One was a brutal secret police force called Savak. I mean, you hardly met anybody who didn't, hadn't lost something themselves or knew somebody who had lost a job, a house, maybe a limb, sometimes a life, to Savak. The other reason, though, was that the Shah was trying to modernize his country. By his standards, he was westernizing his country. He was inviting in Western culture. He was inviting in Western fashion and Western music and Western movies and all the rest. Well. There were, as I recall, the population of Iran then was something like 60 million people. Most of those people did not want Western culture. They simply didn't. The Shah's circle did, but the rest didn't. To them, it meant decadence. And the source of that decadence was the United States of America. So by that measure, if we were the source of their decadence, we were the enemy, which led to The enforcement of the principle that, is, that has long guided rivalries and alliances in, in the Middle East, as long as I covered the place, and that is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. It's a very important principle there. It doesn't mean that you see eye to eye on things, but you only have to see eye to eye on one thing, and that is that you have a common enemy. When we went into Afghanistan 20 plus years ago to rout Al-Qaeda, it was both a, a, a very obviously a blessing to get rid of them, but it was also a curse because we didn't kill them off, as you know. We chased them out to every continent on Earth, and terror groups on every continent mushroomed. And then in 2003, with the invasion of Iraq, that created a leadership vacuum. And you know what they say about a vacuum, something or somebody's going to fill it. In this case, something was born within that vacuum, and that was ISIS. And for a little while, they had their caliphate, but then that was defeated. However, they weren't killed off either. They dispersed into small cells, which is what we're fighting today, because they have the benefit of time to wait, to plan, and then to execute. So today, there are ISIS cells and ISIS wannabes and ISIS copycats uh, in every corner of the planet. That's what we're fighting now. The fact is, the United States is involved in counter-terroristic activities in an astonishing number of nations, whether it's combat on the ground or airstrikes or the insertion of special forces or training local forces to fight terrorist groups. 
We are involved at some level in 85 countries at the last count. That's nearly half the nations on earth. Everything I've talked about so far has been part of the physical infrastructure of terrorism. But there's another piece of terrorism, a newer piece of terrorism, and one with potentially consequential impact on us, even if no missiles cross our shorelines, and that is cyber terrorism. Think of how much of the world depends on the cyber world, which basically means on satellites and the internet. In the Cold War, during the Cold War, we almost felt that we could see if an enemy, which really meant the Soviet Union, were to launch missiles against us, we almost felt like we could see them. We didn't really see them, we would hear them. I mean, I've been to, the United States had several huge listening posts in friendly countries or allied countries outside Soviet borders. I was at a couple of them. The dishes, I don't exaggerate, are as big as this room. So we, would, we thought we would hear, and we would hear missiles coming if they were launched from the borders of the Soviet Union. Cyber terrorism, not so obvious. No way to see it coming. And that's what's scary about it. Think about what would be affected if somebody launched not just an attack on Sony Studios or on a credit card company, but somebody attacked a comprehensive uh, uh, group of institutions dependent on the internet, dependent on the cyber world. I mean, think about it. It's our transportation systems. It's our financial networks. It's our information systems. It's our military communications. It's our energy grids. It's our healthcare records. Not to mention all the creature comforts that we've come to depend on. They all depend on a stable cyber system in this country and, and frankly, all over the world. I mean, think about going to the bank and being told there are no records of the money you say you have. How would you like it if the electricity went off across the board? Or if every airplane or every train, and in some cases bus systems, which depend on the cyber world these days, suddenly we're off, offline. How would you like to use, lose the use of your cell phone? Cyber attacks, if they're launched in a major way, will not melt buildings the way nuclear bombs would. But they could conceivably melt the infrastructure upon which those buildings sit. Nothing you can do about it, nothing I can do about it, but be aware of it. Don't go to bed trembling tonight because it hasn't happened. There's my favorite word in any language. In my business, you, you try to learn about 20 words in whatever language uh, is spoken in the country you visit. You know, and it's basically hello, goodbye, and a few others. But my favorite word in any language is an Arabic word, and it's called malesh. Malesh basically means, M-A-L-E-S-H is how we would uh, transliterate it. And it basically means don't sweat the stuff you can't control. So that's what I think about terrorism. You can't run and hide because somebody might come to school with a machine gun. You could strengthen your defenses, but that doesn't mean as an alternative, you stay at home. And the same thing is true about cyber terrorism. So having made you very happy at the end of your lunch, um, I know that they asked me to leave time for questions. I'm not checking email. I'm seeing what time it is. Uh, if you have questions, shoot. And I, I'm going to remind you all, or tell you, uh, I'm hard of hearing. So the best way to hold the microphone is this way, please, as if you're about to shove a hot dog right down your throat. Hello? Ah, yes. Okay. Uh, hopefully you can hear me, Greg. My wife constantly tells me that I speak too loud, so hopefully you can hear me just fine. You're speaking um, too loud. <laughs> um, 
It seems like you have traveled all over the world, and I'm curious whether you still enjoy traveling or whether at this point you only want to be in Colorado. I'm not a big fan of Elon Musk, but I'm a big fan of what he does and what he hopes to do. What he hopes to do is get me from here to there without sitting on an airplane for 18 hours. Yeah, I love being where I get, and that doesn't just mean on, 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 on pleasure trips. But I will tell you, I mean, I'm 75 years old. I don't have the energy to be in Ukraine as, a, as an American reporter today. But I would give my eye teeth to be there. You know, it, 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 there are certain things you have to have if you do the kind of work that I did for a long time. And one of them is plain and simply adrenaline. Your adrenaline just starts pushing hard so that, you know, despite what's going on around you, you can continue to function. You can't let fear and you can't let worry and anticipation get in the way. So yeah, I'd love to be out there where the big stories are happening, but A, I don't have the, uh, the, the energy, and B, I don't want to sit on airplanes that long. Sorry. Are you counting your steps as you run around? I am, I am. <laughs> oh, thank you. Extensive experience in international terrorism. Are you able to make any applications to domestic terrorism, even as we are experiencing those uh, investigations in this week? Well, I, I think my answer would be the same that any of you would give. I mean, I don't have any great insights, but the bottom line is that terrorism is terrorism. People are going to come out of nowhere. As I said about Al-Qaeda and ISIS, they hide, they strike, they hide again. And that's also true. I mean, think about the major terrorist acts, and they, they multiply every year in this country. Strengthen your defenses. They, with respect to the schools, uh, that's talked about. I mean, I'm, I, I was I'm told specifically not to get into politics, so I won't. I, in my opinion, there are many ways to try to protect our children, and strengthening the defenses at the schools is one of them, but it's an important one. So the same thing is true. I, I, I hate the metal detectors and all the rest, and yet I think they're a necessary part of their lives. They very clearly, they very clearly reduce the possibility that somebody is going to uh, commit an act of violence against us. Uh, Bill mentioned that uh, between two television networks, I worked for, uh, I think, six years for KOA Radio. And I was sort of the House liberal, and the House conservative was a guy named Mike Rosen. Some of you might remember Mike. They would put us together on the radio for an hour once a month to debate each other. But Mike used to say this about proposals for controversial measures. Uh, on social issues, he, he, he would say, if it only saves one life, wouldn't it be worth it? But he was saying it with a cynical tone. In his opinion, it wouldn't be worth it. In my opinion, depending on the cost of those measures, yes, it would. Hi, um, I'm a big international traveler. And, um, oh, this hi, way, sorry, this way, okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm a big international traveler, and uh, I don't have a lot of fear when I travel, but I was wondering if you had any advice uh, when you're in a foreign country, how to minimize risk to yourself. How to minimize what? Uh, risk of being attacked or... Is there anything you should, that people should not do or be aware of? You know, I think my parking meter's expiring. I gotta go. I mean... <laughs> I don't have any great answers. I mean, there's no place, I mean, I mean, look at what I've done in my life. There's no place I won't go. I would say to you, within the context of staying out of countries at war, there's no place you shouldn't go. Just be careful, and being careful means, means the same thing it means if you're in the middle of, uh, you know, walking in Denver at 12 o'clock at night. Just be careful, be aware of your surroundings. I mean, the, the obvious stuff. But no, I, nothing beyond that. My wife and I still travel internationally quite a bit, and uh, I, you know, you're making me think we don't do anything differently than we do here at home. You have some fascinating stories. Do you have any plans for getting some of these events or some of these circumstances written down so that they could be shared with other people? I have. Uh -huh. I don't mean I have plans, I've done it. Uh, 
and you give me a great opportunity to sell my book, which I think these days you can get for $1.89 on Amazon. Uh, it's called Life in the Wrong Lane, because that is where a lot of journalists, international journalists especially, uh, spend their lives. The name comes from this. You might find it amusing. Um, I mean, I've covered a few major hurricanes. The first I covered was called Camille, which, was, uh, which knocked down Biloxi, Mississippi. I was a brand new, I was a producer for three years with ABC before they asked me to be a correspondent. And so I was a producer, and we went down to Biloxi with the camera crew and a correspondent, and it blew Biloxi over. Biloxi was almost abandoned at the time because everybody saw Camille coming, and everybody who had the means or the sense got out of town. Those people were in the right lane. They were getting away from the trouble. I was once watching, right as I started to write a book about what you're asking about, I was watching a television, uh, television coverage at home of a hurricane. Some, I covered Katrina as well, but this was not either of those. But it was a hurricane somewhere on the Gulf Coast, and it was a helicopter shot, you've all seen it probably, of, of an interstate highway jammed. It was almost like a parking lot because everybody was trying to escape the wind. And during this five or 10 second shot, all of a sudden, pew, there goes one car the wrong way. He was heading for the hurricane. And I thought to myself, smugly, those are the journalists. Now they were probably first responders of different kinds, but you know, that's life in the wrong lane means you're heading for the hurricane. So yes, I wrote a book called Life in the Wrong Lane. Should I say it a third time just to make sure? <laughs> um, and, and it's about all the wacky things, the stupid things, the funny things, uh, the dangerous things that foreign correspondents do just to get to the point of reporting a story. It doesn't report the stories because those are reported and forgotten, but it's about the life of a foreign correspondent. And uh, uh, I better say it twice, life in the wrong lane. Notice I said that more slowly than anything else I've said to you in the last hour. Uh, but, but the point, and, and, and here's one thing for you to know, every chapter is about a different set of events in a different country. There's Afghanistan and there's, you know, there's Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, and so forth, Uganda. But every chapter has something that I hope people find amusing, and I've been told by readers they do, even though a lot of them are about very dark events and dark days. But something, even if it's graveyard humor, turns up kind of, you know, that can bring a smile if not a laugh. There are a lot of experiences that correspondents have where there's nothing to laugh about. I would guess nobody could write a whole book or a whole, even a chapter about Ukraine and bring a smile to your face. So it's only chapters where there's, there is that opportunity. But thank you for asking about life in the wrong lane. I think we have one more, que one more question. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my 34-year-old son just survived an a avalanche. A little slower, My 34-year-old son just survived an avalanche that took his friend's life in front of him. So I, you had the same kind of thing happen three times. Did you get therapy for trauma and survivor's guilt, or how did you get past it to live a good life going forward after losing three people next to you? Um, the answer is no, no therapy no training and no therapy, probably should have been. I'm just lucky. I don't know what changes one person's constitution from another's, but I was able to go on. You know, if, if you don't let those things affect you at all, you're not normal. But if you let them make you dysfunctional, I mean, you are normal, but then you're dysfunctional. And you can't really, I don't think you can make the choice. Plenty of journalists, like plenty of soldiers, like plenty of first responders of different kinds, have PTSD, get PTSD. Some, it lives with them forever, some it doesn't. I was just one of the lucky ones who was able to go on. I, I wanna tell you one thing about Rotary, by the way. Um, I have seen signs of Rotary's work around the world. Uh, I mean, I can, I can picture uh, in Bolivia, uh, we were, we were doing, a, doing a documentary actually about the drug war, and in Bolivia, on the, on the uh, other side of the Andes from the capital, uh, meaning you cross over a 17,000 foot pass, makes Colorado look flat, uh, that's where they grow the coca. 
Coca is not cocaine, but it's the main ingredient in cocaine. And we were driving down the road, down the other side, and there was a big billboard saying this such and such. I don't remember what it was anymore. The work of Rotary International. Uh, I can picture it in Tanzania. I can picture it in Vietnam. So thank you for your contributions to Rotary because of its contributions to making this a better world. So thank you. Greg, thank you. One of our traditions at Boulder Rotary is that we get the last word. <laughs> and uh, as a journalist myself on a very different level than you were, um, I recognize that there are lots of things right now that we are able to be anxious about and that part of journalists' jobs is to help us understand them so we don't have to be so anxious. And we all appreciate what you've done in that regard. And to thank you for being here today, we'd like to donate in your name 100 doses of polio vaccine oh, to Boulder, to Boulder to Rotary's Polio Plus Fund. And um, we're this close to curing polio, which is one of the big things that Rotary has worked on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to add something to what you just said, because you said we didn't work at the same levels. As a journalist, as fellow journalists, we work at the same level, because we hopefully, if we do our jobs decently, help people understand the world around them. And we get to see things firsthand that they don't, and we have a front row seat, and we get then to communicate. My greatest satisfaction is getting to share what I have the privilege of seeing, even if it's awfully bad stuff, uh, with people who only otherwise would know about it third hand. And whether you're covering city council or, or, a, or a war in Nicaragua, uh, the impact is the same. So thank you. We, d we did both work at the Rocky Mountain News. Huh? Just for just for the record. Yeah. <laughs>